Hello friends, this is Dr. Eric Stansbury welcoming you to today's restoration. Please let somebody know that we're on the air and today we're going to be looking at coming to his table. And let somebody know, I think this is an important word for you and your family. And it's especially as we move into these last days and get ready for the rapture of the church. Let somebody know we're on the air. We'll be right back. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever that you're joining me right here today on, on Restoration. I want you to please get your Bible, if you have it, and go to Isaiah chapter number 55. Isaiah chapter number 55. I believe we are living in the last days. I believe that we don't have much time left on God's prophetic calendar before he comes back, he sends Christ back to collect his bride. What I also believe is that the church is caught between two things. Jesus would warn the disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. The leaven of the Pharisees being religion, the leaven of Herod being politics. The enemy, the fallen realm, doesn't matter which side of the ditch you fall off on, as long as you're not in the middle of the road following Scripture. And to that end, he has in these last days created something different that we as the body of Christ have to know how to deal with. Isaiah chapter 55, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy grain and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Simply accept it as a gift from God. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your earnings for that which does not sat for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight in abundance. Incline your ear to listen to come and come to me. Hear that so that your soul may live, and it will make and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, according to the faithful mercies promised and shown to David. Listen carefully. I have appointed him, David, as representing the Messiah to be a witness to the nations regarding salvation, a people and commander to the peoples, a leader and commander to the peoples. In fact, you, Israel, will call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that does not know you will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. He says there, everyone who thirsts, everyone who's hungry. You need to understand that there is a difference between hunger and thirst and appetite. We know that hunger is physiological. It occurs because of biological changes throughout the body. And it signals that you need to eat to maintain energy levels. Appetite is simply the desire to eat. It can be a result of hunger but often has other causes like emotional or environmental conditions. As Perry Stone said in one of his recent services, there is a difference between a hunger and an appetite. So in Isaiah 55 and verse 1 here, he says, Come. If you're hungry, if you're thirsty, come. We are called to the table. In Psalm chapter 23 and verse number 5, it says that he prepares a table in front of us, in the presence of our enemies. God has created a table for you, for me, in the midst of all the crazy. He's created a table and says to us, if you're hungry, eat here. If you're thirsty, drink here. If you need anything, come to this table. We are, co we are called to this because he wants fellowship. He wants you and I to be part of his family. If you say, well, Brother Eric, that's nice that you found an instance in the Old Testament, but what about the New Testament? Absolutely. If you go now to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. I'm going to try to stay very much in teaching mode today. I can still get happy, and I will probably. 
But I want you to look at something. Matthew chapter 22. It's a parable of a marriage feast that Jesus tells. We're going to begin reading with verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who had previously been invited to the wedding feast, but they refused to come. Then he sent out some other servants, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves are ready. They're butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. But they paid no attention. They disregarded the invitation, treating it with contempt, and went away, one to his farm and another to his business, businesses. The rest of the invited guests seized his servants and mistreated them, insulting and humiliating them, and killed them. Almost stop there for a minute. He says, my feast is ready, everybody come. And immediately, people begin giving excuses. I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that. When we talked about a few weeks ago, the tops of soil, there are, these are the people who they hear the word, they, they want to be part, but when it comes time to make the choice, the things of this life kind of choke that out of them. What is Jesus saying? He's saying it is a decision. Coming to his table is a decision. You make the decision, I'm hungry, I need to eat. I'm thirsty, I need to drink. And he gives us this, this entire parable saying that I've invited all of the people, the people that was originally invited, the Jewish nation, people, and they, and they had their excuses. They mistreated the son, the servants, which they will mistreat the church. He will send out again and say, go to the highways and the hedges. Go to get those that were never even invited and bring them in. What he's trying to get you and I in the church world today to understand we are simply to be inviting people to come sit at God's table, not ours. Revival is not about the evangelist. Revival is not about the singing group or the location or whatever you want to fill in the blank. Revival is when we instill in other people a hunger for the things of God. When we instill in them and they see in our lives that we have been, we are sitting at the master's table and our lives have been changed, that that instills in them, that brings them and puts in them a hunger. We are called to go to the table. So first of all, I need to understand, there's an open invitation. Today, he is inviting you, he's inviting me, and even people that you would not yourself invite, he's saying, come and eat. Now, we open up in Isaiah 55 and verse 1 where he talks about thirst. There are two types of thirst according to medical doctors. There's what we call the osmotic thirst. That's where you just need water to refill the water in your body, the water in your cells, that they need that to survive. The second one, and if I, mis if I mispronounce this, any of my friends in the medical profession, please feel free to correct me. But it's hypovolemic, which means... You're drinking and you need nourishment to feed the cell, to replace what is there, to replace the nutrients in your body. That, that thirst becomes primal because your body knows what it needs. So in our text, he gives several versions of liquid. He starts off, first of all, with water. He says, come have water. In John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, it says that Jesus, on the final and most important day of the feast, stood and cried. He cried in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, who cleaves and trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. But he was speaking here of the Spirit, whom they who believed trusted had faith in him were afterward to receive, for the Holy Spirit had not been yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified or raised to honor. He's saying, look, I need you. If you're thirsty, come to me. Not to Buddha, not to the Republican Party, not to the Democratic Party, not to fill in the blank, come to me. If you are thirsty for the things of God, if you are thirsty for a change in your life, you can go buy all the self-help books that you want. You can go talk to all the people you want to talk to. But can I just tell you, if you want to truly quench that thirst, only Jesus Christ can do that. And when he instills in you his spirit, 
it will begin to make changes. In John chapter number 4, verses 4 through 15, Jesus is having a conversation with a woman that the world would have discounted because she had been divorced and remarried multiple times. And she was so cut away from the Samaritan society that when she found Jesus, she came at the, in the heat part of the day to the well. And then Jesus spoke to her and said, can I have a drink? And she goes, do you not realize that I'm a Samaritan? You're not supposed to be talking to me. And he goes, and she goes, plus you have nothing to, to draw with. And he says, ma'am, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me to give you living water so that you would never thirst again. And they have a conversation about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And then she comes and says, give me this living water. Give me this living water. Here is a, a woman whose life was just, who was messed up from the floor up. She was tore up from the floor up. Yet, she says, give me that living water. He triggered in her that thirst. Now, only that he wants to give us wine. Now, wine in the Old Testament and in the New always symbolized a covenant blessing. When they would drink, when we drank, they drank the wine, the cup of wine at Passover, it reminded them of the covenant that God had with them. And then Jesus says, now, when you drink the wine, the juice, it symbolizes the new covenant between me and you. The covenant of the New Testament saying that now you can be saved and set free. That wine, also we see that Paul will use it in juxtapositional phrasing in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Now I want you to pay close attention to what I'm going to say. He says, do not be drunk where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There is a reason why he put being drunk on wine and being drunk in the spirit. Because in both of those cases, the person who's doing it loses control. If you've ever seen someone that is intoxicated, that is drunk, they really don't care what you think. They don't care what they do. They have no fear. They just do. They just do. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2, the first thing people said, hey, these men are drunk on new wine. And Peter said, we're not drunk as you suppose. We're not drunk the way you think of drunks being, but we are drunk. He did not say we're not drunk. He just said we're not drunk as you suppose. Saying that we have we've taken in something that has changed the way we perceive and the way we behave and the way we act. You know, drunks talk with a slurred speech, and we don't understand them, but fellow drunks always seem to understand fellow drunks. And I think that when we get to the point that we are truly drinking deeply from the cup of the wine of the new covenant, it's changing not only our insides and outsides, we, we no longer have the fear of other people because we're so lost in, if you will, the intoxication of the Holy Spirit. There are so many people today that they go to church and, they, and they, they're just as dry and dead when they go in and as they come out because no one is passing out the cup of wine. And I'm not talking about going to the liquor store and buying some kind of wine and saying, let's all get wasted at church. I'm saying that when they come into church, we're not offering the water of the Spirit. We're not offering the wine of the Spirit, the wine of that covenant. And the last thing he says, hey, come get milk, milk and honey in the promised land, that sign of abundance, a sign of nourishment. The church should be bringing people to life. When we sit at God's table, when we are sitting at the table he has prepared before us in the presence and in front of all of our enemies, what should be happening is our soul is being replenished and refilled with the water of the Holy Spirit. Our behavior is now under the control of the Holy Spirit. We no longer are ourselves. We're not acting as Eric. I'm not acting as my human self. But there's something in me that's driving a different behavior pattern. It is the pattern where I believe in faith that if God said it then that means that God will do it that becomes the place when I no longer have fear and I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because I fear no evil because he's with me and then when we are drinking that wine we're drinking the water of the spirit we're drinking the milk of the word we are growing through the power of the word it's beginning to change us and it begins to nourish our spirits it begins to open our eyes and as all of those things come together at the table we begin to find satisfaction just in those components but then he says I need you to come buy bread in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 3 notice what Moses writes and he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you 
with manna. He allowed you to get to a place of hunger. Then he fed you with manna going on, which you did not know, nor your fathers know, that he might make you recognize and personally know this, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Yeshua will quote this particular verse when he's in the wilderness in Luke chapter 4 and verse 8. He will tell the say, he will tell the accuser, he'll go, look, I don't need to turn these stones to bread because my bread. He'll even say this to the disciples, I have food that you don't know anything about. He said, because he said, I live not by the bread, not by these stones, not by physical food, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to get to the place in our own spiritual experiences that we crave, we desire, we need God's word in our lives. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus is talking, and manna has been brought up on how that he fed them in the wilderness. And Jesus says this in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry, and he who believes in and cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me will never thirst any more at any time. Jesus said, when you're partaking of me, I'm going to change the, the dynamic. And he picks up again in verse 48. I am the bread of life that gives life the living bread. Your forefathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. But this is the bread that came down, that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and never die. I myself am this living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And also the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. He ties it in. He says, I am the bread. Do you know that so many people, they go to church and they have no relationship and they're, they're checking the box. They're not eating. It would be like going to a giant feast put on or a, a buffet table and say, I'll just have you know a glass of sweet tea with lemon rather than saying, let me get a plate and get all that I can. My downfall, as you know, I am trying to lose weight, but my downfall is not cake. It's not cake candy it's not sweets however you put hot fresh baked rolls in front of me I'm going to eat them uh, well I have to have bread at every meal and it's, it's I know it's a southern thing I, I have a hard time turning down fresh biscuits you say Dr. Sansbury why are you telling us this I'm telling you this that there comes a point when my desire for God's word has to reach that level that this becomes the food that I eat the food that I crave that I realize I can't make it Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday and Sunday just checking a box just getting my appetite taken care of some Sometimes when my wife and I, we get ready to go out to eat, she'll say, go like this. What sounds good? And that's when you just have an appetite. That's when you just say, well, you know, I like pizza or spaghetti or fried chicken. I have an appetite. That doesn't mean I'm hungry. That just means that that's my appetite. Or sometimes we do comfort food. Uh, people, when they are depressed, they eat ice cream or they will begin to engorge and gorge and gorge. We eat for, we have an appetite for our emotions are tied to. But a hunger says, I have to have this to survive. I need this to live. If I don't get that, I will surely, surely die. And then Jesus will tie that together, saying that he is that bread of life that we take of him. God is calling you and me to a table where life and more abundant life is being offered, where he is offering you today you, the opportunity to sit down at his table, to sit down with the king of all kings and the God of the universe, to sit there at that table that he's prepared, that he has laid out for you and he's laid out for me so that we can grow and we can be strong and we can be the witnesses to other people. I have two dogs. I love my two dogs, Merlin and Arthur. And every now and again, Arthur will eat a treat. Merlin will go by and smell his breath to see if he wants that same treat. I believe that it is time the church becomes so in, so 
filled with the smell of bread. In the book of Ruth, it says that there was bread in, in Bethlehem again, the house of God. And that's why they went, they left where they were to go back to Bethlehem. Why? Because there was bread in the house of God. It is time that you and I be, smell like a bakery. That when people come in contact, they smell, they feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, when a person who is a, a, an alcoholic, they smell like alcohol all of the time. Or people that work in, in bakeries. My dad had worked when I was growing up at Bendix Brake Shoes uh, there in Cleveland, Tennessee, and when he would come home, he smelled like asbestos, and he, that's why he, he, out, his clothes, no matter what, he, no matter how many times uh, my mom would wash them, they would still have that scent of asbestos on them, and I'm believing that what God is calling you and I to in these last days is that we don't smell like the world, we smell like his ovens. We smell like his house. We, our clothes begin to feel and smell the anointing of God. That when we are around people, they're, oh, where have you been? Can I go? Where have you, where, why, you're looking so healthy. Where, where are you eating? What are you doing? And when, and we can have then the conversations. We don't have to go around and start smacking people on the head with the Bible, but we should be such a living letter that they look at your life in good times and bad, in prosperity and in lack and like Paul says in all things I've learned to be content and when people would see in Paul's life that there was something different something burning in his life and it drew people to Paul when we get to the point that every time the master says come and dine we run to that table we don't want to get up from that table but we're always eating father can I take a sandwich home from the table can I fill up my water bottle can I do what I need to do. And, and when we, you get to the point that that becomes your driving point, when that becomes my driving force, suddenly the things of this world begin to lose their luster. You see, and we're going to get into this maybe next week. Well, we probably will have to wait to get into some of this next week. But it is your body that wants to be in charge, the flesh, the senses, and we are commanded for the spirit to be in charge and be in command of the senses. E.W. Kenyon will write in his book, about new creation realities that our spirit man has unlimited growth potential our bodies are limited i, I can never be any taller than five foot ten inches I can never, you know, I can do all exercise and do, but I'll probably never get to the point at 54 that I can run a, a three, a four minute mile. I can run a four day mile, uh, but it, it, there's so many things that, that I know that I can't do because my physical body is limited. But when my spirit man is driving and he's in control because he's got direct connection to the heavenly Father, that he is sitting next to Jesus. They're sitting next to the Father, and I'm hearing what the father's saying and I'm eating from his table I'm not eating from the enemy's table nor does the enemy as Louis, uh, Louis Giglio says neither do I give the enemy a seat at my table because the only seat at my table is not is not for anybody else but me and my brother and my father that we sit together and in a, in a meal that is prepared and the Holy Spirit in dwelling and moving and changing and that I abide in him and he abides in me as he abides in the father and I see answers to prayer and and I I got someone posted on social media that when I, a friend of mine posted that God gives us the desires of our heart and he got all religious but there are times I truly believe that sometimes God just does out of his love for us gives us something that we've desired that won't harm us because simply he loves us but he also is changing our desires and changing our thoughts and changing because as we eat his food, as we eat, my palate becomes different. When I used to work for an auction company, I would not eat baked beans for love or money. Here's what's weird. I still won't eat pinto beans, but I will eat baked beans. And here's why. We were working one day. It was a very long auction, and I was hungry, truly, truly hungry. And they were offering barbecue sandwiches and baked beans. My, but they wouldn't let me just get the sandwich. And I've been raised in such a way that I just can't throw things away. I have to do something with it. Find somebody else to eat it or do something. And as I was sitting there, I took the sandwich. I took, And I tried the baked beans. And I liked them. So I eat them now. And my wife keeps trying to figure out ways to trick me into eating other things. 
but I had to be hungry. And over time, my palate has changed. Even some foods that I used to like, I no longer like because my palate has changed. As you grow in Christ, as you're eating at that table, your palate changes. The things of this world kind of lose their luster. This morning, my friend, He's calling you to the table. Next week, we're going to talk about other parts because I'm just flat running out of time. But let me stop right here and do this. He's calling you to the table. And you may be saying, Dr. Eric, okay, he's calling me to the table. I don't know how to get there. Can I help you with your invitation? He says, if you will believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And know that God raised him from the dead, that he's coming back. You'll be saved. That's entrance into the table. And then when you come before the throne of God, and when someone may ask you, why do you think you're worthy? Because the man sitting next to the Father said, I am. He said, I am the righteousness of Christ. And I just came here to eat. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you that you hear us and that you're helping us through every storm of life. I pray, Lord, that this word today will, can, will move and continue to go forward. Bring people into the kingdom of God. and Bring them into your kingdom and to have them sit at your table. And we're going to be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week, we'll pick up right here and continue in Isaiah chapter 55. If you've enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up, subscribe. But then let somebody know that next week, we're going to pick up with part two of the sermon, Are You Hungry or Thirsty? Come to the table. I look forward to hearing from you this week and, and praying for you. I'll be right back. Thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget that at any time you can email me right here in Decatur, Texas at pastorstansberry at gmail.com and I'll respond to your email. I'm looking forward to your email, how I can pray for you and how we can reach out and help you become the living letter to a dying world. We'll see you next week.